Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, being uh, here. And uh, I always uh, thank you also for uh, giving me a chance to share with you my burden and uh, also my uh, challenge. Uh, this issue is not only for us, but uh, I got a chance to talk about this issue uh, to many uh, Far Eastern uh, intellectuals, uh, mainly Chinese, and uh, different campuses. And I may get a chance to talk to some groups in Beijing this summer. But uh, so uh, let me just. Uh, um, suggest that uh, the biblical reasons for integration, and then uh, I chose integration in this aspect, evolution and intelligent design, uh, is uh, first of all, uh, uh, you, you, I just like to discuss that with us, that all of us have a uh, imperative as Christians and in, as intellectuals to think about our uh, profession as well as our, our faith in a more intelligent way. And secondly, I'd like to evaluate some of the positions that uh, various Christians, uh, perspectives, and uh, uh, traditions uh, uh, discuss, so just very briefly, and the strengths and the weaknesses. And then thirdly, some of the philosophical discussion of methodological naturalism, which is very popular right now, and even among Christians. But I'd like to suggest that there is also another criterion, which is an inference of the best explanation. And then fourthly, uh, discussing some of the enigmas of uh, New Darwinian evolution. For evolution, we have to define it more me mechanistically, uh, which is New Darwinian, uh, namely natural selection. <coughs> and fifthly, and uh, finally, uh, is intelligent design a uh, possible alternative paradigm? So, first of all, biblical basis of integration. Uh, first of all, we have to uh, be uh, mindful of our role as steward of God's creation. Genesis 1:28 says that. Uh, we are to rule over the fish of the seas, birds of the air, and every creatures on earth. And then to have a uh, paradigm, to have a uh, holistic uh, view of the creation uh, is our uh, preamble to be a steward of uh, God's creation. And secondly, uh, and, uh, Jesus Christ is uh, incarnate word, and uh, this is actually, actually the peculiarity and the unique characteristic of Christianity among all world, world view that is Emmanuel, God being with us, God coming into flesh to become one of us. And Jesus Christ said in John 17, 16 also that we are in the world, but we are not of the world, just like he was in the world, he's not of the world. So we are supposed to be Christians that exemplify Jesus Christ, exemplify God in flesh, which is uh, try to be identified with everything else surrounding us. And then thirdly, uh, we're supposed to live a life worthy of our calling as Christians, Ephesians 4, one, uh, Paul admonished the uh, Ephesian uh, church that uh, we are supposed to be worthy of the call that we have received. And the call we have to re receive is being salt and light and uh, being uh, ambassador for Christ and uh, bring the message of reconciliation to the world. And uh, so we have to be mindful of how we do our signs and do our profession in, in that way. And finally, all truth is God's truth, uh, made famous by many philosophers, including one here in uh, Wheaton College. John 14, 6 says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And we, being his followers, are supposed to exemplify that. And we should find God's truth everywhere, not only in, in, uh, in nature, but also in scripture. Uh, of course, uh, Jesus Christ is uh, his special revelation. Uh, and then the Bible is testifying uh, for Jesus Christ. Uh, general revelation, we can see God's fingerprints everywhere in nature. But uh, ultimately, because of our sin, we have broken our relationship uh, between God and, and, and uh, people. And uh, so we have to be reconciled through the only mediator of Jesus Christ. So we have to uh, re uh, look at our profession in a Christocentric uh, setting, which is uh, expounded very well by uh, our president, uh, Dr. Lithin. So I'd like to briefly ex uh, just examine some of the evangelical views on uh, creation and evolution. And first of all, let me preface uh, by saying that uh, we have to be mindful uh, that we have to do everything in love. Uh, Augustine once said that, uh, you know, in all the debates in early churches, that in essentials should be unity, in non-essentials liberty, but in everything charity. So we have to. Uh, really remind ourselves that uh, even though we don't necessarily agree among many uh, positions, even we don't agree with secular view on evolution, uh, in the 80s, the court ruled that uh, creationism cannot be taught as science. So, uh, but uh, God says that uh, we still love people. We still, as, as, as Christians, we should still discuss all this in love, and although we may not agree. 
Uh, and the various view is by no means exhaustive, but uh, I have written a short article in the Biblical Dictionary, uh, uh, in Baker's Dictionary of Theology. Uh, so I just sum summarize it very briefly. Uh, there are at least five uh, or six uh, uh, more well-known views. One is the Principiatomic and uh, the Gap Theory view, uh, where uh, you uh, just inserted a big history between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2. Um, and the strength of that is, uh, is reconciling uh, uh, between the biblical data and the scientific data of the old earth and the many fossils. But the weakness is uh, you don't have much exegetical uh, basis of inserting so much between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And then, of course, the young earth creationism, all, all of us are aware of, and the young earth and the parent age. Uh, God made the world in, uh, I mean, God created a very old earth, but it looks, I mean, God created the earth in seven, 24 hour day, but it looked very old. Uh, so the strength of that is um, it uh, is at least accepts so-called literal, and it's certain aspect of literal meaning of the Bible. But the weaknesses is uh, you have a little problem of uh, facing the challenges of the old world, the data, and, the, and then the local flood, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then it's God lying to us if uh, the, the, uh, the earth was very old, but it looked young. I mean, it's very young, they look old. So, and then the third view is very popular among uh, Christian scientists, uh, particularly those in the secular academia. Uh, that is, God created matter in, uh, by natural laws and natural selection is one of the m most important mechanisms by which evolution occurs and the evolution is the way by which God created. And then, uh, of course, the strength of that is uh, eminence of God and then providential uh, sustenance of God uh, in his creation. Uh, and then God is involved very intimately in his, uh, his creation. Uh, but the challenges of this is the historicity of, of the first Adam, uh, of the first uh, parents. Because evolution is by way of, ev of uh, gene frequencies, populations, instead of individuals. So you have to somehow instill some miracles somewhere in the creation of the first couple. And uh, in this particular uh, idea too, uh, let me just uh, uh, suggest that uh, the extreme cases for evangelical that take this position may be, become a process theologian. And I'd like to quote to you uh, what the Howard Van Til, uh, the most famous uh, theistic evolutionist who have written a lot of books, uh, in a, a speech he gave in October 23, 2004, uh, from Calvinism to Clermont, uh, now that's evolution, one scientist evolution from Calvin, Calvin's supernaturalism to Griffin's uh, naturalism. Griffin is a positive theologian, teaches in Clermont uh, the Theological Seminary. He said, uh, I quote uh, Howard Van Til, I have found it necessary to explore a different theological uh, territory beyond traditional supernaturalism in my quest to make sense of life experience of a fully gifted creation perspective. So uh, this, this can be a challenge. Uh, if you want to look at, look at everything as being a, a, a cycle in which God is also involved. Uh, and then fourthly, the creation myth of neo-orthodoxy, which is uh, Karl Barth, a um, very uh, prominent theologian, uh, it, it suggests things such, uh, the myth of creation. Creation doesn't really have a, a lot of historical uh, factual meaning, but it's a myth nonetheless, it's important to us, uh, help us to uh, focal, uh, focalize, uh, focus on our existential needs of, of, uh, of God because we were sinners, we are, we are evil. So it stresses ex existential emphasis of sin and the need of salvation. But the problem is the lack of integration. Uh, we uh, accept God's involvement in our life personally, but deny God's uh, involvement in, in history, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in involving in the creation activities. And then God is, uh, 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 God in creation of the theology of hope. There's a recent uh, Jürgen, uh, Jürgen Martmann from uh, uh, the German school, uh, new orthodox too, but uh, emphasizing on re resurrection center, God indwells creation, and then the strength of that is human is the image of God and the image of the world. We present the world to God, and we present God to the world. Uh, and then uh, the uh, participation, fully participation of humankind in God's creation. Again, the problem is uh, uh, the supernatural uh, uh, transcendence of God uh, is being ignored. And then finally, progressive creation, creationism, which is my personal view, is uh, complementarity uh, between uh, nature and scripture and accept uh, microevolution, but uh, having a lot of doubts about microevolution and uh, can interpret Genesis either as day age, concordance, or framework. Uh, and then the strength of that is uh, least conflicts uh, with uh, science and uh, maintain historicity of the first uh, human couples. Uh, and then there is also challenges in terms of chronology of creation in the first three days versus the last three days. 
But uh, the framework hypothesis and suggests the first three days are distinction, the last three days are adornment, so some of the chronology of geology ne not necessarily need to be harmonized. So uh, next I'd like to consider uh, methodological naturalism, which is the, the, the buzzword for empirical science. Uh, basically it says that uh, science by definition is a study of the natural world, so we should not uh, allow uh, non-materialistic agents or uh, or forces to be uh, involved in scientific studies. But may I suggest that this is uh, not necessarily uh, philosophically uh, restrictive because in certain areas such as historical sciences and empirical sciences, empirical sciences is the area that I'm very much involved in, but others such as people in geology or anthropology or cosmology, you have to look at the origin of life, origin of the universe, and, uh, and so on, then the metaphysical, philosophical presupposition will play a very big role in those areas. Uh, whereas we can discuss uh, without being concerned with your uh, being a Christian or a Buddhist or not uh, on DNA replication, but we would have some issues in terms of where does DNA originate. Uh, so empirical sciences are methodological, but uh, historical sciences are metaphysical. I don't think too many people uh, would uh, deny that. And uh, the they make famous by Thomas Kuhn that in fact, that paradigmatic shifts uh, is based on uh, metaphysical, philosophical <coughs> conversion experiences. And then uh, I'd like to suggest even a, a newer uh, way of discussing uh, the philosophy of science is by some of the more prominent philo philosophy of sciences, such as Alvin Plantinger and then Dale Rash, uh, some of those uh, outspoken Christian evangelical philosophers. And then a uh, particular uh, Plantinger uh, would uh, suggest or would argue there's no philosophical basis to justify a non-materialistic science. Uh, he says that uh, the reason why we are only restricting science to the materialistic explanation is a practical one. Uh, basically, it's because of uh, what uh, uh, the scientific world uh, demands, that we want to accommodate as many different worldviews as possible. And he referred to a, a classical physicist, and uh, which is maybe not very well known to you, but in the philosophy of science, I believe it's very well known, it's called uh, Duhem. Uh, Duhem is a French Catholic and scientist at the time of Newton. And he said, uh, he said, I quote, I have denied metaphysical doctrines the right to testify for or against any physical theory. Whatever I have said of the method by which physics proceeds, or the nature and scope that we must attribute to the theories it constructs, does not in any way prejudice either the metaphysical doctrines or religious beliefs of anyone who accepts my words. The believer and the non-believer may both work in common accord for the progress of physical science such as I have tried to define it. In other words, uh, he's about the time of Newton and I know most, most scientists at that time are theists. Uh, but now it's no longer the case, so uh, to just apply the same principle here, to be just practical, to allow all view, uh, views to be represented in order to make the most achievement in scientific investigation. That's basically the, uh, argued by, uh, by Plantinger. And then in terms of uh, Dale Rash uh, from Calvin, uh, he argues that uh, we have to really judge science by not necessarily the intrinsic uh, definition that was laid uh, on, a, on, a, on a table by most practicing scientists, but actually by the fruitfulness. How fruitful is a certain paradigm? How fruitful is a certain uh, presupposition. So uh, in, other, in other words, uh, uh, instead of the best explanation of scientific uh, phenomena uh, gotta be the materialistic one, uh, you should uh, let the best explanation uh, 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 wherever the evidence uh, that you collected from nature leads you, not necessarily only the materialistic evidences. So that's uh, the kind of just a little bit of philosophical idea that uh, has been uh, just discussed in the theory uh, of science. And then uh, I'd like to point out to you some of the enigmas, challenges that a neo-Darwinian uh, evolutionary paradigm is facing. Uh, and then fr from that, uh, we will have to suggest that maybe the paradigm is not really working, so we need to have a new paradigm to replace it. And first of all, the mystery of the origin of life that uh, many of us are familiar with, in particular physicists and chemists here, that you can help me out with that. Uh, but the uh, important thing is in the physics, the idea is uh, thermodynamics. Uh, before the, e the beginning of life, uh, life is this equilibrium. But uh, in the process, without life, uh, thermodynamic will dictate that you have uh, inorganic molecules uh, can be 
uh, localized and, and combined into organic molecules. Organic molecules can be localized and combined into macromolecules, and macromolecules can be localized and combined into the first replicating entity of a cell, uh, of simulating a cell. But the most important thing, you can see the arrow, instead of pointing forward, it's pointing backward. And that is thermodynamic consideration. Uh, when before there is a, a regulating, cell regulating a system of a cell, uh, thermodynamic would dictate that randomness is, uh, is, uh, is uh, facilitated and then synthesis is, is, is not favored. So most uh, people who are not studying abiogenesis has already recognized there's five prob or six problems. First of all, uh, polymerization of chemical monomers does not set new life processes. And uh, people always use that kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, simulation to suggest that's how life began. But, uh, Crystals can uh, polymerize, crystals can become more complex, but crystals does not uh, give you DNA content, which is information. And then secondly, a cell reproducing internal control uh, is uh, very difficult to be uh, changed over uh, from an external control condition, wh which is what happens in the absence of light. There is no cell to regulate its responses to the environment, but rather all the environmental forces uh, are there to trigger uh, whatever happened in that uh, what they call primordial soup. But every single cell has internal control that you and I have a, it's a biological organism we respond to the environment either positively or negatively. The most basic uh, model uh, such as bacteria lack operon, the, uh, the system whereby a whole system of genes are being regulated in response to environmental cue and then uh, turning on and, and off certain genes. So those are internal control cannot be explained by uh, external control, which is only uh, uh, present in the absence of light. And then thirdly, uh, none of the selective conditions, uh, when people are su suggesting the self-organization of molecules, uh, you may have a quasi-metastable condition uh, in the primordial soup, whereby certain molecules can be built up in complexity, but none of them persist. The important thing is persistence of those conditions to allow those molecules to be uh, replicating perpetu in per per perpetuity. Uh, so the idea is uh, natural selection uh, before the uh, beginning of life uh, doesn't make sense. Most biologists, most geneticists that are really uh, more uh, uh, circumscribed in describing natural selection would not ascribe Darwinian evolution to the abiotic conditions. And then fourthly, uh, random physical uh, chemical forces operate to decrease the formation uh, inter interaction instead of to increase the complexity and synthesis. This is thermodynamics, which is what I've already alluded to. That is, the, the backward arrow is much more prominent than the forward arrow. And then fifthly, uh, some people suggest that self-organization theory that you can really put in a bunch of n numbers and uh, by a certain kind of uh, algorithm, those numbers can generate into such and kind of complex mathematical formula. But the issue is uh, you have the algorithm to start out with. Those numbers have to be plugged into a computer program to get that. That's information already. Uh, so DNA is the information that has to be accounted for in the beginning of life. And uh, the connection between the four bases, G, A, T, C, uh, are not dictated by any kind of physical and chemical forces, but rather is, is coded for by pre-existing algorithm, whatever that is. And then finally, uh, the pre-existence of algorithm to select for the minimally uh, uh, complex uh, Metabolism, which is uh, what is being studied by some biochemists, uh, among which is uh, Alan um, Morowitz, who published a paper on biochemical uh, algorithm, try to suggest there's 11 most basic intermediate in the TCA cycle. Uh, he just look at all the biostein, uh, organic chemistry, look at all the biophysical um, and uh, parameters of those chemicals, and turn out they chose uh, by information, by bio, uh, biochemical physical parameters, uh, 11 molecules. Uh, and then use his choice, which is his algorithm, and then uh, and, uh, uh, come up with uh, the, the rest of the intermediate meta metabolic pathway. So in other words, uh, you have all of those issues being faced by the abiogenesis uh, community. Uh, and then uh, no wonder that uh, Stan Miller said that even though he did the original origin of life experiment, uh, recently has been quoted that not much has been uh, really added to the, the kind of advances he has made uh, 30 some 40 years ago. And then, uh, and most importantly, we have to address the issue of DNA. And uh, the, uh, in the genomic era, which is 21st century, uh, some people said the 20th century is physics, physics and chemistry, and then 21st century is biology. 
Uh, I, I think I believe it because I'm a biologist too. But uh, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, all the uh, the uh, the challenges we're facing in this uh, century would be uh, biotechnology, how to use DNA, and in all kinds of studies. But they have actually tried to define what is a minimally complex cell that they use. It's called global mutagenesis. Take a, I think a very simple cell like mycoplasma, and then uh, randomly mutate it and see what is the minimum number of genes that are left that can still sustain the activity of a minimally active cell, and it turned out to be 500,000 base pairs, uh, or something like 100 genes. So uh, Bill Gates, uh, notorious, I guess, uh, maybe he's trying to temper his, um, his, uh, his uh, image of being a millionaire by making profound statements such as this. Human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than anyone we have ever created, including his Microsoft. So. Uh, so we know that DNA is a very challenging issue. Even Francis Crick, uh, he just died not too long ago, the, the, uh, the famous uh, DNA uh, father of DNA. Uh, he tried to uh, discuss or de describe DNA as something uh, evolved by natural selection. He couldn't, and he has to resort to a theory that maybe DNA was, was actually deposited by some pans uh, panspermia, some, some, some extracellular, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence to, in, the, in the Earth. But uh, so I like to suggest that not only the origin of life is a challenge, uh, but there is also issues in the fossil record. Uh, and then most importantly, the Cambrian explosion. Uh, what is the Cambrian explosion? Uh, the Cambrian explosion is the sudden appearance of major animal phyla in the fossil record during the Cambrian period of geological time about 500 million years ago. And to quote from some geologists, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, it happens during a one minute of a 24-hour geological clock. And uh, 41 body plants, 28 filer, suddenly appear. And th that's why Time Magazine uh, call it a, uh, a uh, evolution's big bang. Okay, but uh, if you want to look at the Darwinian evolution, which is a gradualistic uh, accumulation of small changes in the gene and then uh, morphologically uh, incremental changes, uh, you would uh, expect that uh, in the uh, morphological changes, you should have a very minute, uh, minute changes. Those are the minute changes. Uh, the, the dark dots are the actual finds. The empty spots are, are theoretical, postulated, but were never found. What was found is the, all the phyla, uh, 41 body plants, 28 phyla, uh, around the Cambrian explosion 500 million years, years ago in one minute, all of those happened. And many of them still persist today. Some of them never changed, just like lungfish. And, uh, and horseshoe crab. So, uh, so those are issues that are being faced by the uh, fossil uh, and uh, uh, paleontologists. And uh, some of the paleontologists already uh, have uh, progressed to a state that th they have already started to ascribe teleology to uh, the fossils. And one of which is uh, Conway Morris from Cambridge, who is a theist. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but uh, he says uh, something like that. He said that evolution follows the inevitable and preordained tra traje uh, trajectories in order to bring about human beings. So basically, just like the entropic principle in, uh, in uh, cosmology, the world is fine-tuned to bring human beings uh, into being, and then also the fossils, or uh, biological evolution, is also fine-tuned in order to bring human being into uh, existence. So uh, th uh, this is Conway Morris' book, is, uh, I think, Pretty controversial. It just came out last year. Life, uh, life, uh, a solution. Inevitable humans in a lonely uh, universe. Uh, so not only uh, there is a problem in biogenesis, not only there's a problem of fossil record, but there's also an issue in the molecular strategies in the DNA. And uh, let me uh, suggest to you that uh, the Genome Project is uh, what uh, triggered all this uh, discussion. And uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, particularly the uh, issue of, uh, uh, of the comparative genomic studies. And uh, I have done some of that myself. And uh, the genomic studies, particularly in uh, uh, ribosomal RNA, uh, made famous around 30 years ago in the late uh, 70s, 80s. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the uh, microbiologist just two hours away from here in Urbana, uh, Dr. Carl Weiss, uh, Wos, uh, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Bush will still remember him. He took microbiology from me. And uh, he uh, uncovered a bunch of ribosomal RNA and, uh, and used it to sequence and compare with uh, all the rest of the uh, biological systems. And turned out two-thirds of all biological systems uh, are bacteria. 
That's why I'm a microbiologist. Uh, so, uh, and then the rest of them is everybody else, like plant, animal, fungi, and, and whatnot. So it's called free domain idea. And this free domain idea uh, led him to believe that uh, the origin of life is a whole bunch of genes that are floating around in a um, progeno. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a primordial soup, but rather a gene genetic soup, a whole lot of genes, like alphabets, like the, or your, the cereal that you're picking it out. Uh, and then it somehow popped out into three domains of three lines of uh, descent. And I've done some work myself on that, and uh, I have taken what he has done already, and then look at 68 proteins myself that's available in the sequence in the web, uh, ribosomal, metabolic, biosynthetic, replicational, transcriptional. And then I have uh, looked at uh, at least four species uh, representing the three domains, two bacteria, one AK bacteria, one bacteria, and one eukaryote. And then I look at all the high, highly homologous sequences. And I have actually done that and, uh, with the support of uh, the science division and some students. Uh, the 85% of them, in fact, uh, fall into the three categories. B, A, K, K is eukaryote, A is archaic bacteria, B is bacteria. 85% of them is, uh, is very distinctly categorized in the free domain. And then about 5%, 2%, 4%, 3% respectively, uh, where you have ambiguities, that they sort of group together, two or one and so on, without three distinctive uh, domains. So what I'm suggesting is uh, maybe the, the data is, is quite uh, consistent with a polyphylactic origin, polyphylactic uh, 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 punctualism. Instead of most people believe in the gradualistic, you have a single origin and then uh, it diverges uh, very, very slowly, like gradualistically, or uh, looking at Stephen Jay Gu, uh, idea of punctualism, but still having a single origin. It is, seems to me uh, as consistent, or maybe more so, to uh, multiple origins uh, to start out with. So, uh, so those are the challenges in sequences. And then uh, not only that, in, uh, in a recent book by a molecular biologist, uh, I don't think she's a Christian, but uh, she actually noticed that uh, in evolution, you have molecular strategies. I hope it's not stuck on me again. Uh, I don't know, it's every time I use the, the problem, I still have uh, issue. I try to use a USB uh, bank. <laughs> okay, good, thank you, thanks a lot. Okay, but uh, anyway, uh, you need design also when you do a, a presentation, not evolution. But natural selection must work not just on each individual genes or mutations, but also on the very mechanisms that generate genetic variation. He is, she is actually referring to some of those regulatory circuit, like the homeo homeotic genes, like the regulatory elements, like the op operons. They have to evolve together. The question is, where do they originate? If they don't originate step by step, gradualistically, uh, as most Darwinian would uh, suggest. So she said it's a molecular strategy. That means somebody designed it. She doesn't want to admit there's a designer, but it's somehow inherent in the, in the system. So, uh, oh man, again. How did I fix it before? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. All right, so uh, I would like to suggest that actually experiments being done by some of the ID theorists to try to check this out. I mean, you have concerted evolution pressure on multiple genes instead of a single gene. And uh, Michael B. is well known in uh, proposing the irreducible complexity has actually published a paper uh, last year as actually using multiple point mutation in duplicated uh, uh, genes. Uh, it's more effective in microevolution. Uh, he published his paper in Protein Science. Uh, last year, and uh, suggesting that uh, using his model of having multiple genes uh, and then a certain uh, a population size, and he sort of predicted that uh, multiple genes may be more effective uh, in evolution. In other words, it's no longer gradualistic individual genes. You have molecular strategies. In other words, it's sort of try to just simulate molecular, uh, molecular strategies. Uh, and then uh, uh, so finally, I'd like to go to the idea that uh, irreducible complexity, which is uh, what uh, Michael Behe made uh, famous. Uh, and uh, just the, the Fagella, I think almost everybody heard about that, so I may not want to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, the Fagella has uh, around 50 genes, and uh, there are various parts, and 
Uh, there are people attack uh, this, uh, this module saying that uh, maybe each one of those flagella parts can be used in some other occasion and some other functions. It's called co-optation. But the issue is uh, they all come together and then in this particular setting for the bacteria, flagella for that particular function. And you have to test them uh, step by step in order to document a new Darwinian uh, evolution uh, pattern. Uh, they all come together at the right time, at the right place to become the bacteria flagella to allow the bacteria to do what they are, uh, they are doing. So co-optation is not necessarily a refutation of re reducible complexity. So what is ID? ID, may, may, may it be just an apologetic tool? May it be just uh, the old design argument in, in uh, natural theology? And I submit, to, uh, I submit here it's not. It is not primarily an apologetic tool, contrary to most uh, people's opinion, because uh, we are not really interested in the designer. We're interested in design. That is the empirically detectable pattern. Just like I mentioned, you have a free domains, you have the molecular strategies. Instead of looking into the bit by bit piecemeal evolution of gradualistic evolution, you look at this pattern right in the beginning and try to find those patterns. Instead of really trying to find the, uh, the Occam's razor is what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You just accept the whole chicken, the whole egg, and start from there. Uh, so that's uh, not primarily an apologetic tool. It, it, it's consistent with creation model, but uh, it is also not young earth creationism. In fact, Henry Morris attacked Dembski recently and said that you're not going far enough. So uh, the Dembski re replied very cordially and saying that we are not really trying to defend a young earth. We're just trying to look at something where it's meaningful in, in, uh, in biology. And so ID is not against microevolution. We actually incorporated every bit of natural selection into it. We just start at different levels. Instead of genes, we start at the patterns. Start at whatever, we, you can call it design, you can call it a pattern, you can call it a strategy, okay? And then uh, 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 Dembski said it uh, most nightly. He said, she said, he said, uh, ID is method 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 methodic methodically developing a line of research about which creationism has been ambivalent. Creationism has been just yanking, yanking. Evolution is deficient, but have provided no alternative. And ID is trying to, okay? And then, uh, of course, uh, Dembski has uh, made famous uh, in his uh, the design influence and some of his books uh, that you have three fold filters before you can uh, allude, uh, assign uh, a certain uh, uh, phenomenon to design. You have to eliminate natural law, uh, such as uh, if this can be explainable by gravity or explainable by DNA replication, a central dogma, a regulatory uh, operon model, you don't have to propose design. But uh, ultimately, you come down to chance, mutation. Mutation does occur. Uh, mutation uh, may occur, may, uh, may, uh, may help us understand uh, how a cancer gene may have originated. But ultimately, you have to come to the idea that maybe some of those regulatory circuitry, like the homeobox, like the strategies in molecular evolution, uh, may not have any precedence. It is just there. The uh, algorithms start out from, from that. So that, that is, uh, to him, complex information, complex specified information. And uh, recently, a paper uh, published by one of the ID theorists, uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer, has uh, drawn a lot of flags. And he published it in a regular, uh, most evolutionary uh, uh, outspoken journal, uh, the Journal of Biological Society of Washington, in fact, uh, which uh, is the, uh, the, the official publication of Smithsonian. And then uh, and, uh, after the publication of the paper, uh, Dr. Meyer got a lot of flack, and also the editor of the journal got a lot of flack. And in fact, he was demoted from being editor and was kicked out from his office, uh, was even not talked to by his colleagues in Smithsonian. And then finally, Dr. Sternberg has to file a, a suit against them because he's being discriminated, he, he alleged, uh, on his view on, on this particular paper. And Dr. Meyer said, an experience-based analysis of the causal powers of various explanatory hypotheses suggests purposive or intelligent design as a causal, causally adequate and perhaps the most causally adequate explanation for the origin of the complex specified information required to build the Cambrian animals and the novel forms they represent. For this reason, recent scientific interest in the design hypothesis is unlikely to abate as biologists continue to wrestle with the problem of the origination of biological form in the higher taxa. So I'd like to suggest that uh, the, the scientific evidence is well enough received by at least those peer reviewers of uh, this paper as well as the editor to be published. But it seems to me there is a bias against this, this view. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'd like to suggest some research projects uh, that we can uh, use the ID pro uh, uh, paradigm to do. And I may be actually personally doing some of them. 
Uh, the first one in the genome era is uh, you can uh, look at the junk DNA uh, in the chromosome of the humans uh, is as, uh, instead of as the vestiges of evolution, which is most evolutionist uh, assumption, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a possible design, uh, possible patterns that maybe need to be unraveled. They're no longer junk if you uh, look at it that way. They may review important functions, like some of the stuff that my wife and I go garage sale and buy and put in the garage, never can be put to use. But when you need it, you need it. And, uh, and then secondly, non-random mechanisms in genomic uh, evolution. Uh, genomic evolution, you have patterns, uh, you have uh, various uh, so-called pseudogenes, and you have uh, regulatory elements that seem to be conserved in various uh, hox genes being conserved in various animals and, and plants and, and so on. They may be non-random, they're just there. But you, you, you don't want to figure out how, how did it get evolved gene by gene, DNA by DNA, but they were there. Somehow the algorithm already be consistent. And that helped us to start from there and to look at other things instead of really uh, you know, just uh, spitting hair and trying to find out where those uh, genes may have originated. And thirdly, uh, endosymbiosis, uh, endosymbiogenesis of mitochondria and chloroplast. For a long time, uh, this theory hasn't really gone too far, but uh, if uh, the ID people got their way, uh, the two, the organism, which is originally somehow coming together, one may be bacteria in nature, one is protozoa in nature coming together, and benefit each other instead of benefit itself, which is survival of the fittest, which is natural selection based on uh, survival of a single organism. But now it's a survival of mutualistic, symbiotic relationship of multiple organisms. So it can really shed some light on the mitochondria uh, being uh, somehow a, a bacteria in origin and somehow become uh, part of the cell. And finally, uh, which is closest to mine, uh, is unique gene expression related to particular organisms of species in microarray studies. And one of our alumni just uh, came back last uh, week to talk in the case. She just sent me a whole uh, a whole list of microarray data from NIH that uh, is deposited. Uh, if you were to, evo uh, to have an evolutionary perspective, all species were alike, they were originated from a single source, you will have a chance to miss some unique features, unique characteristics of each cell or each tissues. And currently, the microarray studies, which is diagnostic, and we, I have brought that gentleman from Harvard to come here last week to talk about their studies, and uh, from the Dr. David Sukavika, our former alumni, uh, we are trying to uh, use algorithms and to try to screen in the human genome using specific uh, probe, uh, specific gene expressions of different tissues. Like uh, they are looking at the lung cancer versus uh, other kinds of cancers. But uh, this is the hardest uh, area of research right now. You know, looking at unique gene sequences, unique gene expressions in different tissues and different species. And it seems to me the ID people may have uh, an upper hand on that because they believe in uniqueness instead of uh, being common in everything else. And then finally, how do you judge ID being, uh, being successful? I'd like to just read of you, this is all from Dembski, so uh, I think it's self-explanatory without my further explanation, uh, that wh where these arguments are sound, two, where these evidence for design is solid, three, where this critique of materialistic accounts of evolution holds up, and four, whether it is developing into a fruitful scientific research program. I'd like to add here, uh, you can say that uh, ID doesn't lead anywhere. Well, but you don't get it to give it a chance to be tested. Of course, we can give you a whole lot of fruits. I just suggest that there are some ways by which you can test this kind of presupposition. Uh, you allow us to use this kind of perspective instead of discriminating us when we publish something that uh, is not materialistic. And then finally, uh, whether it is convincing to people uh, with no stake in the outcome of this debate. I think some people discriminate against this view, like the Smithsonian, because the whole Smithsonian was constructed uh, on evolutionary paradigm. And everybody who, anybody who's published anything that threatened that paradigm would be, uh, would be uh, enemy. So, so uh, with, 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 with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, on these uh, next to last uh, slide, the list of four uh, projects. Right. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no smoking gun anywhere. I think it's, uh, it's a turning of minds, like uh, the conversion experience Thomas Kuhn was suggesting. Like Einstein, you are familiar with him, his work and me. Einstein somehow just single-handedly convinced his generation that he's, uh, by theoretical construction, mathematically first, 
that Newtonian physics is not as well explained by the math mathematics he developed. So it seems to me there needs to be a concerted effort and some genius coming along. I don't, I don't think any one of them is a smoking gun. I think it will be, uh, need to be uh, like you and me, uh, being at least Christian, and then we are intellectuals, being open to that first. If we Christians are first open in it, to it, and then we are allowing our kids to follow it, and then we can uh, hope, hopefully convince our secular colleagues to do the same. And the other question is, how does intelligent design do with all the, uh, with, with, with race and that occurs? I mean, when 99.99% of all species are extinct and uh, so much is just lost and what race is, how does intelligent design deal with that issue? Right, thank you. Uh, I think I meant to point it out. Uh, when we talk about uh, the historical empirical science in, uh, I think in slide uh, number five or so. Uh, uh, in this uh, slide here, I think uh, I talk about uh, that the historical empirical sciences and then the practical and philosophical sciences. Uh, ID doesn't really uh, in involve the benevolent creator necessarily. Of course, uh, Christian believe in a ben benevolent creator, but Christian also believe in a, in a Satan. And Satan can be as, as great a designer as, as our creator. And then there are so much, uh, so red tooth and claw out there in nature. They may not be designed by God, but they may be designed by Satan, but nonetheless designed. So what I'm saying is design doesn't necessarily, that's why we're saying ID is not necessarily apologetic. It's just a pattern. The pattern can be so called, are you calling uh, so wasteful and others is beneficial, depending which, who is doing the designing. But we are con not concerned about a designer. We're concerned about a design. Yes, sir. Uh, that, that minor paper that was published is not peer reviewed. It is peer reviewed. No, the editor admitted he had unilaterally accepted it. Well, not what I read. There are two peer reviewers, uh, Sternenberg and plus two other reviewers, but the, the names were not released. That's true. But uh, what I read is uh, from Sternenberg itself, himself. He said there are two additional peer reviewers. He's the editor. Well, I thought he had said he was Well, anyway, I was more interested in that. Uh, the summary, the Behe's article, basically, this is uh, maybe 20. Uh, okay, uh, Behe's article is saying that uh, he suggests that there are multiple uh, mutations. This article here that uh, simulating evolution by gene duplication of protein features that require multiple amino acid residues. In other words, a, ne a new Darwinian evolution would suggest every DNA change in small bits, single base change. Most, most, most useful uh, uh, changes are single base changes because they can be silent, they can be selected for, selected against. But he's saying that you have multiple genes that are not necessarily a single amino acid. There's at least two amino acids according to him. He's just simulating it. Of course, it's not an empirical study, but simulation. But nonetheless, the simulation works, that you need uh, multiple amino acid residue to uh, come together to, for in gene duplication. Uh, it, it's a certain uh, size of the population is simulated, which is representing the, the biological species of the world, and uh, simulate the uh, mutational rate according to a certain rate that uh, is acceptable in molecular uh, uh, evolution. So basically, it's just suggesting that you have patterns or you have at least concerted amino acid residues coming together in order to duplicate to explain some of those uh, mutation rates. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Um, how does that fitting into the ID paradigm? Um, it sounded to me like you're suggesting that um, this might be an area that ID would suggest a new way of evolution sort of occurring via symbiosis. But it seems to me that the endothelial theory is a very naturalistic. Right. Uh, what I, what the, that the theory is suggesting uh, is not originated from me, it's from one of the uh, biochemists from another school. He is saying that uh, ID will be consistent with mutualistic symbiotic relationship, whereas naturalistic is, uh, is uh, survival of the fittest. Of course, it's no, but you, you, you have to have find out that two cells somehow decided to come together to benefit each other. Why that occur? But, the, but that could be accepted within the ID framework. Right. And, and from there, then, uh, it seems to follow logically that right. um, evolution occurred from that single right. eukaryotic cell. Right. From Right. The, the idea is the origin of complexity, or origin of patterns. 
we are not we uh, worry about at least uh, the I am not personally uh, worry about how does human get where we are. We can right right yeah that's why I said it, it's never against microevolution. Natural selection is still a very interesting idea, but instead of a continuation, everything is continuous from a single origin. You may have steps, in other words. So that particular step may have been somehow uh, blessed by God and not Well, we don't want to look at the designer as, as again. Okay. This is not apologetics, but rather it's a program of studies. I found that statement interesting, too, because it started out with the worldview concept. And right. Right, but of course uh, it's consistent with, with the worldview of God's uh, being involved in every step. But some, some, sometimes is uh, supernaturalistically, others is naturalistically. Yes, sir. So would would you classify you as like the the divine genesis? Right. Right. Well, basically, Stephen Gay, Gay, Jay Gould uh, was well accepted in paleontology, but uh, we are trying to translate this kind of work to more fundamental theoretical level. See, punctuation, what does it mean? We're suggesting you may have pun uh, punctuated patterns all over. Instead of looking at a continuation or origination of those patterns, a punctuation, we recognize it being there and go from there. So, and we have to judge whether we're successful by using that kind of thinking to search for future scientific uh, data.